Welcome to the DTS Fitness Education Podcast. My name is Ben McDonald, and I am here with Rob Wilson, co-founder of The Art of Breath. How are you, Rob? I am wonderful. Thank you, sir. What a wonderful and energetic intro. <laughs> well, I tried, mate. I've, I've drank a, a significant amount of coffee before I came on. The, uh, before we came on. <laughs> and we're going to be talking today about, funnily enough, uh, breathing uh, and how good, like I can just see by looking at you, Rob, that you are really good at breathing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I, 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 I do my best. I don't, know, I don't know what it is that emanates from me um, <laughs> that indicates that, but, but I try. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, like we said before we came on air I think it's like the beard you've got like everything going on you know what I mean and it was like oh uh, for people who were, who were listening to this and not watching Rob's got a beautiful beard that he grew all by himself that's a, that is a fact fact number one I have an awesome beard thing but I have to be honest if I'm totally candid uh, my barber sculpts it because it actually grows out away from my face so if i let it if i if i don't do anything with it it looks like i got electrocuted all the time <laughs> uh, mate, i like that uh, as most people who know me know uh, i don't go and see a barber rob i do not go and see a barber i have like nowhere but anyway that's a that's a totally different story my friend totally different story <laughs> all right let's uh, let's get into it brother if you are ready to go yeah let's hit it excellent so question number one uh, what are the main benefits of diaphragmatic breathing for adults and children? Well, good, good gosh. So, you know, diaphragmatic breathing is, is really important. And here's, I want to make an important distinction here is that um, you can never not use your diaphragm when you breathe. There's no choice. Um, every breath you, your diaphragm gets used. It's kind of like, um, if your elbow bends, then your bicep is involved. It's just to what degree, right? right. And, and how well is that action balanced with the other joints and tissues um, ar around the elbow? And it's the same thing with the diaphragm. So because of the way our lungs function, um, the diaphragm is always involved in every single breath. Uh, it's never off, right? Um, and that's because the lungs don't inflate on their own right? They, they basically can only return to their original shape on their own. When the diaphragm contracts, it opens up your rib cage, and then that change in pressure creates a vacuum, and that's what fills your lungs up. If your diaphragm stops working, uh, you die. So, so it's, it's, always, it's always functioning, but what's really important about the diaphragm and learning to use it as a skill is that it's the only, well, it's not the only, it's one of the very few, one of two ways that connects us to our brainstem deep reactions. So what I mean by that is our autonomic nervous system, right? And so normally processes like breathing and heart rate and blood pressure are continually self-regulated by our physiology, right? It's responding to our internal and external environment all the time. Our rate and depth of breath is always shifting. If we're speaking, it changes. But the diaphragm control, for the most part, living in that brainstem, it's below our conscious level of awareness. But the really cool thing is that I can decide to breathe in a different way. I can't decide for my heart to pump in a different way. I can't decide to change the size of my blood vessels, but what I can decide to do is change the way I'm breathing. And so what it, what it sort of acts as a, a doorway that opens up into deep physiological processes that are normally outside of our conscious level of awareness, and they have a tremendous cascade of influence over uh, the way our body deals with stress, and the way that we manage energy and fatigue, um, our posture, and it's an enormous cascade of benefits when we learn to use it well, and it's an enormous cascade of detriments when it becomes dysfunctional. Excellent, mate. And I think, um, I think for something that, as you said, we can control, whether you're 
uh, a child, whether you're an adult, uh, whatever it may be, something that we can control that can have such a huge effect on everything that we do. Um, and it's free. You know, <laughs> it's just it's like... free. That's right. You don't have to have a gym membership. You don't have to like all this and the other. You can actually work on it yourself. I think is a, it is a, is a, a, a key piece of everything that we do, health and fitness and well-being as well for adults and children. That's, uh, that's excellent, mate. I like that. I like that. Well, we can we, control it. Yeah, we have access to it 24 hours a day, seven days a week for our entire lives, you know, barring severe illness or death. And that's a really powerful tool because let's say, for example, I'm having a situation where um, I'm not reacting to stressful scenarios in my life the way I want to. It can be really hard to deal with that stuff just trying to use mental tools. And so if you have a tool that grabs onto your physiology, grabs onto something that's very real and can change it, change how you feel in your body, then that gives you, like you said, some sense of control over things that can seem almost like a dust cloud in your brain. Like there's just nothing to really grab onto. Um, but your physiology, you can feel it come down. And that works for kids and works for athletes and it will work for my grandma. Um, and, and that's why I, I'm really drawn to the, to the work because of its scalability. Fantastic, mate. I like that. I like that. Okay, number two. There are many techniques out there, my mate. What's the number one for reducing stress and the number one for improving performance, in your opinion, Rob? I would have to say the number one thing is awareness. So, you know, one thing specifically for us is that, you know, with the art of breath is we sort of feel like a technique a technique develops from the understanding of outcome, right? And so if I have a, if I understand what the principles of the physiology are that I'm ultimately trying to shape, then I can create a goal. So, and that doesn't mean necessarily like a long-term goal. It could just mean, Hey, if I'm an athlete and I want to have better conditioning, then that will lead me to the technique I want. And I'm going to give you a more specific answer, but I think this is, uh, an important parlay is that anytime you get fixated on one way of doing something, then you miss all of the other important components around it. And so at least for me and the way that I work with people is, you know, I don't think everybody needs to have some master's level education on breath function. Like not everybody's interested in that like I am, but what I would say is that it is important to know your why. Yeah. And your why will then lead you to a technique. But if I had to say for reducing stress and improving performance, the number one thing that I would recommend is that people improve their CO2 tolerance. Um, that has the biggest crossover that we've seen physiologically. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Patrick McCune's work can help you do that. Buccieco, um, uh, free diving work, some yogic pranayama stuff. All of those have that touch point of improving the body's tolerance for carbon dioxide. And what we have seen is that both um, stress reactivity improve and athletic performance increase with increased tolerance to carbon dioxide. Fantastic, mate. So instead of it being like one for one and one for the other, that's just like the biggest bang for your buck is reducing your or improving your tolerance to CO2. Yes, sir. That's exactly correct. That's fantastic, mate. That's uh, so, uh, that's that's great. And there's plenty of stuff out there on that. And you guys cover uh, a significant portion of that in the Out of Breath as well. Yeah, we do. Um, a, a pretty fair amount of our work revolves around the physiology that operates that system. Um, and, you know, if people want to learn learn more about it. There's, there's lots of education in there, especially in the free diving community. I would say that they've, they've have done um, the most work on creating tools for improving carbon dioxide tolerance. Cause that's what, that's what they're doing. Right. Um, and um, you know, our work obviously has some ways, ways to work towards that. And it's a really important concept. And as we study that physiology more, we realize how many touch points it has in human health and performance. And 
Um, actually, uh, Brian McKenzie, who's the founder of Power Speed Endurance and the co-founder of Art of Breath with me, um, he and I uh, have just take, we're, we're just starting a nonprofit organization here in the States uh, called the uh, Human Health and Performance uh, Foundation. And the idea is to support research um, into these areas like anxiety and performance and things like that. And one of our primary focal points is understanding carbon dioxide tolerance um, better and putting it under uh, scientific scrutiny. And, and, and thus far in preliminary work, uh, both scientific in, in scientific research studies and in just boatloads of anecdotal work, um, we have seen improvements uh, and radical changes with both anxiety and stress reduction, stress reactivity, and enhancements in, in sports performance. That's fantastic, mate. I will, I'll, I'll look forward to hearing some more stuff about that then in the, uh, in the very near future. That's For sure. That's excellent, my mate. You'll have to keep us abreast of the, uh, of the research that comes out. Brilliant. Okay, so um, number three, in your material, you talk about putting the body into different shapes, um, which I thought was interesting. Like I was watching guys hanging from bars with balloons in their mouths and all that sort of stuff. So putting the body into different shapes to see uh, how we breathe and how it's compromised, uh, how we breathe in compromised positions. Where, when, and with who would you use those techniques? Um, well, so, I mean, if you think about it, you know, it seems like kind of a, kind of a novel thing, right. To like put the body in these different shapes. And, you know, we use a balloon at the seminar when as people get into different shapes, because it's a really simple visual indicator of their ability to breathe and the changes based on whether they're, their shoulder position is open or they're squatting or, you know, bracing, things like that. And, you know, if you think about another version of that is just yoga positions, yeah. you know, so yoga figured this out a long time ago that, okay, great. It's good to be able to breathe when everything is perfect, right? When my head, shoulders, trunk and hips are in alignment, that reduces the amount of sort of basic stress on my spinal position and that's the easiest place to take a breath well how much of my easiest and total capacity can i maintain as my body starts to change shapes because very rarely are we sitting perfectly still in an upright position that's not life and it's definitely not sport sport by definition is positional compromise yeah. and who can maintain their skill under positional compromise, under metabolic compromise, and under cognitive compromise. And so if you know that the nature of the environment already has those three pieces, then I wanna make sure that my baselines are as good as possible. And I mean, that makes total sense. That's why we do strength and conditioning in the first place, is to make my baseline as good as possible so that when I'm in situations that are more stressful, my 80% is better than the other person's 100%. Like that's, that's the general thinking, right? Is that yeah. over time I'm improving the top end of what I'm capable of. And if we think about that from the perspective of breathing, I think we could all fundamentally agree that in order for our body to process energy, we have to have air coming in. I think, yeah, I think we can, we right. can put that in as a given. <laughs> right. So, but what we do most of the time to increase our access to energy is work harder. We work harder and we work more, but we don't go to the fundamental component of the system that actually delivers energy. It'd be like in a car, just driving it more and more and just thinking about only increasing the size of the gas tank, but never actually increasing fuel efficiency and how well and how well the fuel could get into the system. So it would be like having a kink in the fuel line and then just trying to dump more and more gas into the car when you fuel it. So instead, what we're trying to do is remove that kink, make the system as efficient as possible at bringing energy in and then processing that energy so it can actually be utilized. And so the way that that transfers to breathing mechanics is that if my basic shapes are really good and I can expand my rib cage and my lungs don't have to work as hard to fill with air, 
regardless of what shape or position I'm in, that I'm going to be more effective at processing energy and getting rid of waste, regardless of what kind of environmental stressors that I put myself under. Um, and for me personally, where I see this the most and one of the places the most obvious, so I'm a big, uh, like I'm totally obsessed with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, and I would say when it comes to like positional compromise, um, I haven't experienced anything else um, that, that compromised my sort of my best position, quote unquote, right? That spinal alignment optimal breathing position more than jujitsu. My body's twisted and folded. And, you know, I, I'm in all these odd shapes, many that you didn't even think your body was capable of making. And what you realize is that as your baseline ability to breathe, as your good mechanics and optimal positions get better, then when you're in these compromised positions, you're at less of a total deficit. And what are we talking about here? Something every trainer, coach, athlete is familiar with we're talking about vo2 right vo2 is volume of oxygen well if your rib cage can literally move more and your lungs can expand that's more volume of oxygen going into the system and that's the first step into processing energy more effectively i mean if you think about let's say normally you could take in eight liters of air and under a specific sporting situation like that's, I just made that up off the top of my head. <laughs> so if anybody's a sports scientist listening to this, please don't go, well, eight liters depends on the height and weight of the person divided by how they tie their shoelaces. I'm just making that up, okay? So let's say normally I could take in eight liters, and then I get a little bit of expansion through my breath practice, and then I can take in nine liters now. Well, that means that's a 12.5% improvement in my ability to bring air into the system. That's not, I didn't work any harder and during conditioning. I didn't have to put in more time on the erg or do more road work or whatever. I just literally made the container more effective at bringing fuel in. Now, is that the last step? Absolutely not. But it's like, it's almost like free money sitting on the table that people just completely ignore because for the most part, breathing is, it's auto-regulated. You don't have to think about it, right? But it's this sort of really potent tool that is just waiting for all of us to take advantage of. And like you said earlier, it's free. So once you learn what needs to happen, you realize how simple the steps are to making it better. And it's like, from an athletic perspective, you have this huge advantage because your body fuels itself more effectively. And from a health perspective, you have a huge advantage because your body fuels itself yeah. more effectively. So it's this really amazing and powerful thing that you have to manipulate your physiology that doesn't require more time in the gym, more time on the floor, uh, lifting harder, you know? So it's just a more precise way of, of dealing with our energy inputs. And that really comes from something as simple as a starting point of, Breathe better when you're in the best position possible and breathe better when you're in compromised positions. And that's what yoga figured out like 5,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that, mate. I like that. Um, as we spoke about earlier, before we came on, my background is combat sports. So I used to train, uh, train a lot, some quite high level fighters. And just like you say, everybody in that sort of world is so obsessed with power output what could imp I need to improve power output and that will make my punches. It'll make my kicks stronger. What I used to do was don't worry about your power output, focus on power delivery. If you can take out all these little kinks in the chain, you don't have to work any harder. You, you know what I mean? You are just maximizing what you've already got. So if you can breathe more efficiently, like what you're saying, uh, Rob, then you don't have to do anything else. You are just maximizing something that you're already doing. Exactly. We all have to breathe anyway. So it's not like you have to, you have to add something into your training. And this is one of the misnomers too, is that a lot of people, when they think about breath control, it's always like some yogi guy or girl sitting somewhere in a forest, like up levitating in a tree or some shit. <laughs> and, and 
you know, sitting there for hours and it doesn't have to be like that. Some people don't like seated breath work at all. Now for me, I think if you really want to get the most out of the practice, you have to have some practice where you're in a formal position, seated, kneeling, whatever. That's my opinion, but you can use it right on a training floor integrated with exercise that you already do. Nobody goes, well, during my uh, exercise, I don't breathe. <laughs> That's total nonsense. You're breathing anyway. It's just, hey, can I breathe more effectively? Um, can I breathe more efficiently? Can I add, actually, you can add stress into the system in certain ways with breathing that allow you to get better results from your training because we know training is stress. And uh, there's some ways you can restrict your breathing during training that actually get you a better, uh, better muscular endurance results and, and things like that. So it's a huge component. It's this huge sort of toggle that we don't manipulate. We know we can run farther. We know we can lift more. We can change the angle in the treadmill. You know, we can do dumbbells, kettlebells. There's all these variables that we play with, but we never actually altered the fundamental energy producing resource which is how we're breathing while we're doing all that stuff oh that's that, that's fantastic mate i'm like I, I, we could this could go on for a significant amount of time rob <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this oh. is my thing <laughs> that's fantastic mate okay next question what's the big uh, what's the biggest area of opportunity for breathwork right now in your opinion, so it could be relieving anxiety, improving cardiorespiratory fitness, whatever you see is the biggest opportunity. We've spoke about uh, um, some numerous components. So what is your, uh, the biggest area of opportunity for breathing you see right now? I think it's in, I think from my perspective, even though I'm a sports nerd, when we talk about the scale, like scalability and largest opportunity to improve life for as many people as possible. I think reducing the effects of anxiety um, and giving people uh, a more empowering way to deal with stress and the, the way that they react to it. Um, there's a anxiety epidemic yeah. in the West, especially in, in the States. Um, there's a youth anxiety problem um, where kids don't really know how to self-regulate um, when they're feeling stressed or anxious or under pressure or having uh, social discord, they don't really know how to self-regulate. And I think if there was only, if somebody put a gun to my head today and said, you can only teach breathing uh, to one group of people, I would say, okay, then I'll take kids. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would agree. I mean, we cover, as we said earlier, we cover some uh, breathing fundamentals on, uh, on our uh, base certificate, which is the DTS level one. And we talk a lot about that anxiety component and people sort of, the stress cup is already full, Rob. And then, as you said earlier, a little earlier, um, training is a stressor. So as coaches, I mean, people are already stressed coming in. They're going to get their asses kicked and all this that, and the other, you know. It, it, I would sometimes what we need to do is focus on giving people um, uh, like um, a strategy to reduce that stress, reduce that anxiety, uh, because then with a half empty cup, you can actually put something in it. If the cup's already full, you know what I mean? You can't put anything right. else in there. That's right. Um, one, of our, uh, one of our colleagues and, and a gentleman who, who works with us in the seminar from time to time, um, his name is John DeMoss, and he, he runs a, a fitness and training facility in, in Dallas, Texas. And you know, one of the things he does that I thought that I think is really cool is when people, when his clients come in, there's actually a board with a set of questions, right? And this, I think he said usually it's from two to four questions. And it's an indicator of where am I on the spectrum of sort of arousal and stress. And if I'm having trouble getting up, then he actually gives them a breath protocol at the beginning of their warm up that will help them get up in energy, you know? So he said like college kids who are home for the summer, for example, they sleep until noon and they come in, they're kind of groggy. And so those kids generally, generally need something to like wake them up and get them focused and participating. Whereas on the other hand, people who, um, for example, are really tired or stressed from a day of work, they might end up getting a down regulation protocol. And so the beginning of the warm up actually files people into these places so that 
when the group warm up begins, everybody's in the same place. And so it ends up funneling them to the same warm up, but they start by dealing with, hey, where am I in that cup? Is my cup full or is my cup too empty? Sometimes it's too empty. And when you go into training, it takes a while for people to kind of like get into it. Right. Um, so I always thought that was a really cool idea is to have these sort of categorize people to bucket them in. I'm, I'm not aroused enough. My, I need to like ping the system up. And then some people who are already the gears are spinning too fast and to get them to come down and then bring everyone together when they're at the sort of half cup mark and go, okay, now we're ready and let's focus and get some good training. Wow, that's mate. I've ne- do you know what? I think that is super cool, brother. I've never even uh, I've never even thought of something like that before. That's fantastic. Me neither. Me neither. I was when he told me about that. I was like, man, I am so jealous that I didn't think of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what we could do is, I mean, we could just cut that piece out of the podcast if you want, and then we could just say that we come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, be, feel free to put it up, but definitely, uh, you know, give give John John his due. Um, yeah, oh, he's a he's, yeah, he's a really bright guy, and, um, and 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 I really was like, damn, I wish I thought of that, but <laughs> no dice. No <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, mate. That's brilliant. Okay, uh, what are your top three things as a coach slash trainer can work on with their clients? Top three, top three, my man, top three. I'm putting you under the uh, under the cosh. Yeah. All right. So one, I would, I think, um, breath, breath awareness. You know, when if we're talking, are we talking like specifically breath or like anything? So uh, we've got to keep it to breath, otherwise this is going to be like, oh, mate, you know what All I mean? Right. <laughs> okay. So one thing I would say is the first step would be awareness, because most people are they're not aware at all of of how they're breathing. And I think as coaches and trainers, we put parameters on other things like how people move, like, okay, we're going to do whatever we're going to do a hundred squats. But during these hundred squats, if your knees start to cave in, you have to take a break. Yeah. Right. And that's so that we maintain some semblance of quality, but we don't do that with the way we breathe. So I would say one, one thing is maybe to put some criteria around how people breathe. And, you know, we'd like to start doing it with new people with just in their warm up just so we don't overwhelm them. And it might be something like, hey, during your warm up today, you're not allowed to open your mouth. So I want you to be aware of any time you work so hard that your mouth is open, right? And that's the first step. It's just like, hey, I want you to, and that helps people start to tune into their physiology. A lot of times it's just sort of like a get her done yeah. kind of mentality. And let me, just, let me just check the right boxes and then I'm done for the day and goodbye. Um, and I think it's one way for coaches and trainers to offer a way for their clients and athletes to get more focused and tune into their physiology uh, a little bit more effectively. Um, secondarily, um, I would say paying attention to position, right? How, how are they moving? Can they even control that diaphragm when they're working out, right? Can I, can I, ha- do I have access to a deep full breath or am I stuck in the top sort of in the neck and chest in sort of a hyperventilation scenario or can I draw my breathing low into the ribs and probably the easiest place to start using that is during recovery periods. So if you're doing interval work or something like that, if somebody's not used to purposefully breathing when they're working hard, um, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, And a lot of times they just check out from it. They just go, forget this. Um, So I think starting with like a recovery period and just saying, hey, can you breathe low into your ribs? Can you use that diaphragm? Um, And that helps them start to develop the skill of uh, diaphragmatic breathing. And then I would say thirdly, post-training, getting them to learn how to transition. So when they're done training, uh, they can take their, their clients and their athletes and help them do some slow breathing, bring their heart rate down for a few minutes. And this could be standing there. That could be sitting on a, on a box or a bench or laying down on the ground, but to do something to purposefully breathe. And an easy way to do that is um, by trying to slow the exhale, 
progressively yeah. over that time, right? And that's a very, very simple, simplistic answer. But just to each breath to try to make the exhale a little bit slower than the inhale and to progressively increase the time of the exhale over the course of the two minutes or whatever. Um, and I think that has that third one has uh, multiple benefits. It's one, it helps the person transition from what they were just doing to the environment they're about to go into. Yes. So it helps them purposefully shift focus. Yeah. Um, and then two, if the trainer is really clever, then they can say, they can start to sort of insinuate training is stress. You can transition from stress anytime. So this is a applicable skill. So let's say you got an argument with your boss just before leaving work and you notice your body feels similar to when you're done training your heart rate's up and you're a little sweaty in the armpits and you, you got, you know, you get the anger sweats <laughs> yeah. and, and you get in your car and instead of immediately taking off and sharing your frustration with everybody who you're sharing the road with or your family or whoever, you can take two minutes and use that same protocol from training in your car and transition like, okay, you know what? This isn't how I want to deal with everything else. So and you can just use the same exact protocol because the reality is that on the most fundamental level, your physiology responds to stress in the same way. Um, and so starting to get, starting to create a better relationship with purposefully transitioning from states of stress reaction to uh, states of calm and alertness is a really important skill. And this goes right back to what I was saying about kids is they don't have good tools to interrupt their own physiology. And I think what will happen is if we start to use that stuff with our clients, they'll see the value and then automatically start using it with their kids. And that's what we've seen in our own community is that, you know, like for example, we have an out breathing app and people just started sharing it with their children because they noticed that it worked for them. Like, oh man, this helped me calm down and feel better. Oh, you know what? Little Johnny is having trouble getting to sleep tonight. I'm just gonna have him do this breathing thing and it calms them down before bed and then kids start to see the value for themselves and they figure it out because we know kids learn fast right? oh, once, yeah. they, once they see value and they're going to model our behavior so if they see hey i'm self-regulating in a way that is powerful they're just going to copy because they're copying our methods for self-regulation anyway just normally it comes from the outside in. So, you know, those are the three things I think would be good is having some kind of um, parameters around breathing in the warm up um, that help people tune into their physiology. Two, being specific about what kind of mechanics are allowed, uh, especially during recovery time periods during training, and to make the most of those time periods. And then to have some kind of um, purposeful transition post training. Um, before everybody moves on to something else mate that is fantastic brother that was like i was like whoa that is <laughs> flipping heck i think uh, like the top three coaches and trainers and uh, they should have their pens and pencils out and be like "Woo, i'm taking this down my man because i'm i'm taking it down i'm taking it down okay in your opinion my mate what is the number one thing a client can do to get the biggest return with their breathing? Um, you know, so I think even more so than um, like starting a breathing practice, you know, my, my sort of knee-jerk reaction because it's what's worked for me is to have a breathing practice where you sit somewhere. Um, but I think, you know, it sort of falls back to the last question, I think. If it's a client, to take one of those three things that I just gave, figure out which one helps you feel the way you want to feel, and then use it when you're not in a controlled environment, right? And so it's kind of like when a client comes to us and they have back problems and they can't lift anything up, and we teach them how to deadlift or how to squat, they're going to key into some sort of mechanical cue 
that they're going to use. And I know this has happened for me a lot. People have come after a few months or a year of training and saying, Oh my God, I never thought I would be able to pick up that bag of mulch. Yeah. And that's the stuff that ends up really being meaningful. Like people like PRs and oh, I deadlifted. Yeah. When you're talking about the average person, they like when they could change their own tire by the side of the road and yeah. it didn't hurt. And they didn't even consider it till it was after they just knew, Hey, I'm capable. And they executed based on the mechanics and the practice they've learned. And so I would say is if you take one of these ideas that I gave one of these three in the previous question, if you are working with the client and there's one that really resonates for them, then I would encourage you to just keep doing it because consistency is more important than anything else. So yeah. just find what works for you. For me, I'm a, I'm a breath nerd. So I have like a practice every single day that I do in the morning. Um, but some people, that's not their jam. And to just find something throughout the day where you go, mm, I know this feeling from when I worked out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that breathing thing that I learned whatever that is, fill in the blank, the slower and slower breathing, the cueing into my ribs and, or, you know, okay, I'm just going to try to breathe through my nose slow and even any of those will start to shift the way that your nervous system is working. And there was actually this really interesting study um, that was done by uh, Dr. Jose Herrero, um, where they were, he's a, a neurologist that works with really severe epileptic patients. And these patients, uh, their seizures are so uh, impairing that they have cranial implants where there's a constant read on their brain waves. And if basically the, the noise in the brain waves start to look like a seizure is coming, it will interrupt that with an electrical charge, right? And so they have constant um, supervision over brainwave activity. And what they found by accident initially is that just asking patients to take some agency over their breathing, not a special protocol, not a yoga meditation, just paying attention to their own breathing, it organized brainwave activity immediately. Not in five minutes, not in two days, not in 10 years, right now. These are people with no experience, and in fact, who are at a deficit. And so just paying attention to their breathing shifted their nervous system in real time. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Now, the more skilled you get at it, the more powerful your results are, and the more consistent you are, the more powerful your results are, just like any other exercise you do. But I would say whichever one of those sort of three that I gave speaks to you, do that one whenever you have a chance. Yeah, I like that, mate. Do you know what? I think um, I think it can get confusing for people, eh? When we start talking, people talk about mindfulness, right? Um, and it's probably a little bit different with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but for me, <laughs> uh, when I'm sort of fighting and stuff like that, I have to be present in what I'm doing. I can't be thinking about other things. And that is my mindfulness. For if sure. You, as you're talking about like the, uh, the study that was done there where people are paying attention and actually um, looking at how they breathe in, in any given moment, then that in itself is mindfulness because you're paying attention to what is happening inside your own body internally right there in that given moment. That's exactly right. And the thing that... You know, I think, you know, the mindfulness, like the intention of the mindfulness movement is really good. And it's helped um, a lot of people. I just think um, it can be kind of vague what that means and what that fe what the feeling of that is. And um, sometimes with that kind of work, especially with as much stimulation is coming at us all the time. Um, it can feel sort of akin to throwing a lasso on a cloud. Um, <laughs> you, you, know, you, you can't really grab it. Um, but the way your body feels is, is very real. And I know people, who, especially who have problems with anxiety and stress reactivity and, and panic disorder and things like that, the feeling is very physical. Yeah. You know? And so to have a tool to interrupt the physical is, is really powerful. And actually, um, if I could just sort of have a brief segue, um, last week I spoke at um, 
basically like a professional education day for the educators, the K through 12 educators in the city that I live in. And we did this really simple exercise. I had about an hour to speak with a couple of groups and we did a couple of things, right? So everybody was seated. And, and if you're listening to this, um, you can try this, right? And so what, what I had them do was basically take five breaths and then hold their breath and then stomp their feet on the ground, sitting in a chair, and then slap their hands on their thighs, right? And then they did four breaths, and they did it again, three, again, two, again, one, and so on. And what happens when you do that, of course, is what you would expect is their heart rate went up, right? And so that feeling of heart, of your heart rate going up and trying to move your body while you're holding your breath can kind of induce a panicky kind of feeling and out of control and your mind starts to go everywhere. And we use that to sort of illustrate like, hey, this is the feeling of stress. And everybody knows this physical feeling of stress, but what induces this feeling is very different from person to person. And that's why sometimes some of the cognitive tools that we have are hard to employ because what stresses one person out and what stresses another person out can be very divergent. Now, what we did at the end of the session was we did that exact same movement pattern five stomp, four stomp, three stomp, two stomp, one stomp. And then we had everybody find their pulse. And what we did was once everybody found their pulse, we did a big breath in through the nose and then out slow with the mouth. And then we just successively in through the nose, slower through the mouth, slower, slower, slower. And what you can feel when you find your pulse is that your heart rate starts to slow down. And what that does is it creates a connection between, hey, I'm controlling my breath and my, phys my physiology is changing and the static in my brain is starting to organize. And once you connect those feelings together, then when it's imposed on you and you go, oh, this is that feeling and you identify it earlier and earlier and earlier and you get better and better and better at interrupting it before it turns into this unmanageable, stressed out, sort of chaotic thing that's happening in your mind, you can start getting ahead of it. But it's because you're associating it with a feeling in your body. It's just like if you're an athlete or you're somebody who's been in physical practice a long time, you're really tuned in to what your body is and is not capable of. And when you start getting close to an injury, you go, ooh, this is how my back feels before I do the thing. Yeah. That makes me not train. I better back off. And that's just because you have a lot of experience and you associate that feeling with the resulting behavior. We're doing the same thing with breathing here. It's just in a different context. It's, oh, wait, hey, I know this feeling of this panic thing. This is the same thing that happens when I do the breath hold thing. But wait. If I do that breathing technique, it changes what happens. That doesn't mean if you're at a 10, you go to a one and fall asleep. It means if you're at a 10, maybe it brings you to an eight, right? If you're at an eight, you do it a little longer. Maybe it brings you only to a seven and you kind of hang out at a seven. Hey, a seven's better than at a 10 freaking out. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, Hey, I have the power to change it. And that sometimes is enough. Sometimes it's enough for somebody to know I have some dominion over how I feel and what's going on in my brain. Yeah. Um, so I know that was a really long answer to that question. No, mate. Hey, listen, <laughs> that is flaming perfect. Do you know what? I think um, uh, I was doing, I was looking at some stuff on panic attacks um, and people were saying the biggest causation of panic attack, pa sorry, biggest causation of panic attack is stressing about having another panic attack. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it absolutely is. And if you think about it, panic attacks come, panic attacks come unexpectedly. Sometimes you could be doing something that's, that you actually intellectually, you know, is like, oh, I find this enjoyable, but there's that little seed of Ugh, panic attacks are unexpected and I don't have control over when they show up. And when my body feels that way, I don't know what to do. And it's all of that sort of unknown prediction that starts to sort of pile, dog pile one onto the other. Um, but if you have some kind of breath practice, there's sort of two benefits is that one, you go directly to the physiology. 
right? So it, yeah. it directly creates a wedge between the physiology and what's going on in your brain. Then two is that you carry it all the time. Yes. Right. And so if it's something that you would have to take from the outside and there's a place for medication when it's properly used, but what if you're out? What if you don't have it? What if you forgot it? Yeah, what if yeah. it's in a different drawer than you normally put it in? You have to have something that's inside that at least you can start to do something on your own behalf. You can intervene on your own behalf and get it to a level that's manageable and then get help, talk to somebody, take medication, use counseling, see your doctor, whatever. But at least you have this, you have this tool that's just with you all the time and it's free and it's, it's a super powerful thing to know and to just carry with you. Oh, that's, that's perfect, mate. Yeah. I think that's a, uh, the key thing is that you've always got it with you. That's uh, that's brilliant. Excellent, mate. Well, flipping heck. That was like, Oh, we went, we went, uh, we, we got into it there, lad, eh? Yeah. Uh, so Rob, what's been going on with you? I know you were saying that you've been traveling, but what's been going on with you? What's, uh, what's happening now and what are you looking at uh, in the future? Um, well, right now we're, we're starting to, uh, so we have a course here in my home city of, uh, uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, November 9th. And I'm not sure, you know, what the timeline is on the release of this, th this conversation, but um, we have a course coming up and then uh, our, we're off for November or the rest of November and December and then back at it in January. And so um, we're looking at at least the first quarter um, Atlanta uh, and, and Austin. So, we're starting to jam on next year, both in the Art of Breath 101, which is our, you know, our basic uh, educational offering. And then uh, we're also starting to put our 102, which is uh, pretty performance oriented. Um, and then I think probably some of the things we're the most excited about are some of the research projects um, that we're involved in. So I briefly mentioned earlier the Health and Human Performance Foundation and uh, we recently received our 501c3 uh, nonprofit status. Nice. And congratulations, mate. Thank you. That's quite a process. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Tanya Bentley, who's our CEO, for really spearheading that. Like, I didn't experience much of the misery that was associated <laughs> with that process. Um, but, but she, she did. Uh, but we have some really cool projects uh, cooking up. Um, Right now, we have an active project with a fire department in Henderson, Kentucky, where we're trying to see if um, a simple breathing protocol during exercise can Im improve um, time on oxygen uh, during firefighter tasks. So that's a really cool project. And, you know, literally, if you can add a minute to tank time for a firefighter, that's, that's life-saving yeah. for them or someone who they're trying to find. Um, and so that for me is a, is a really powerful thing. Um, we were just involved in a study uh, at California State Fullerton, actually in uh, Dr. Andy Galpin's lab with one, of his, um, with one of his students. And we found a, not to get super nerdy here, but we found a statistically significant correlation between uh, carbon dioxide tolerance and state anxiety. Um, and so that is one of the main areas that we're trying to uh, pursue is understanding the physiology of anxiety and then what tools allow us to best intercept um, those, those feelings and those states. So the ability to self-regulate and then how can we scale those tools to um, youth populations, especially because uh, right now they seem to be having uh, the most trouble with self-regulation and, and anxiety and stress. Oh, mate, that's uh, that's flaming fantastic, mate. And anybody who's uh, for the listeners, anybody who's interested uh, in what. Uh, Rob does and what his team does. Uh, we've got all the links to uh, site, to the website, to all the courses. We've got all the links in the uh, the podcast description. So have a look in there and you'll find Rob. Uh, no problem. No problem. Um, excellent. Rob, now is the time, my friend. Now is the time. This is questions that matter, my friend. And I, <laughs> this is questions that matter. And I think I've asked this question a significant number of times but we can't quite seem to get one sort of like definitive answer. The voting is on the fence. So in your opinion, who would win a fight 
between a great white shark, a great white shark, and a saltwater croc, and why? Oh uh, man, that is a hard question. <laughs> That's tough. Um, th is there a specific environment, or well, just they're in the, they're in salt water? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I'm I'm giving it to the I'm giving it to the uh, to the great white. I'm giving it to the great white, and I'll and and here's why. Great whites can like swallow a Volkswagen bug, <laughs> <laughs> and they're much better swimmers in the open in the open water. Now, that said, Orca takes them both. Do you reckon? Oh, curveball from Rob. Oh mate, that might I might have to, it might have to become a a, a three way a three way uh, battle list. You know what I mean? Well, we know orcas eat great whites, mate. Okay, well that's just fruit. That's just fruit. It right. The cat is now amongst <laughs> the pigeons, my man. And now the cat's now amongst the pigeons. All right, brother. Thank you very much, Rob, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule, traveling and all that sort of stuff and doing all these fantastic projects, my mate, and taking time to come and speak to us today, brother. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Excellent, mate. I'm going to finish it with a go, Rob Wilson. Awesome. Did you know that DTS Fitness Education are actually... An education company, that's right. So if you like what you see and you would like a little more, go to dtsfitnesseducation.com and check out our live and online courses.